All right, folks, thank you for joining us here on Patreon, where you can always get first access to our unrestricted sections. We are continuing through our talks on Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. This is chapters 26 through 30. A lot of fun, exciting stuff. I am Luke. I am Melissa. And this is the podcast that must not be named. Uh, Clearly, you know that, uh, hopefully. (laughs) If not, uh, welcome. And we do have a wonderful special guest, which you heard on one of these chapters already. Abby, welcome back. Hi, guys. Good to be back. Thank, thank you for filling in for me uh, on, on chapter 26. I, I did my best. I'm no Luke, folks. I'm no Luke. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a wonderful job. That's the Six. second chapter you've you've covered my butt for, I believe. I think so. I don't know. And then immediately after, he asks me, "Hey, asks? Did I just say axe? I asked oh, you. No. Yeah. Edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, how did it go? And what did you guys talk about? And I said, uh, just how simple it should have been. And he's like, Yeah, an Aqualong. That's Scuba Gear. I'm like, Oh man. Yeah, cause, yeah you really brought up like the. Wait, because you guys had a whole discussion on why so they should have just used scuba. And I was like, yeah. they specifically say why that doesn't work. They talk yeah, about that. Really did. He's like, uh, at Aquila. I was like, oh, okay, fine. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Anyway, you know wonderful what? job. I've been here. Yeah, had you been here, I would have known. <laughs> I have no room to talk, so. (laughs) Well, either way, these are some pretty plot-driving chapters, I think. Uh, Melissa, you have the most actually written down notes, so I'm going to let you kind of go through them, and I'm sure discussions will roll right out as we're going. Okay, um, so a couple of caveats. One, I write these as I read the chapters, so some of these has been a while. I don't really know what I mean, some of the time. And two, I didn't bring my book with me, so I might read my note and go, I don't know what I mean, and I can't look it up. But (laughs) here we go, we're going to jump in. So we're going to start at the very beginning of chapter 26, right? This is um, right after, yeah, okay, I'm going to really rewind. This is right after Harry was stuck on the stairs in chapter 25, I believe. Mm-hmm. And kind of telling um, Ron Hermione about all of this. So the three of them, Harry, Ron, Hermione, discussing their questions at the beginning of chapter 26, right? The questions were like, Ron wants to know why people keep searching Snape. Hermione, Hermione's all like, well, why is Crouch faking sick? And Harry just wants to know what Snape's first chance was. Those were like their three big points. Well, I wouldn't mm-hmm. know this, right? So it's why are they searching Snape? Why is Crouch faking sick? And what was Snape's first chance? All good questions, kids. All good questions. <laughs> Completely oh. valid. <laughs> I agree with you. Yes. Which question do you want to know? Yeah, those. That's what I'd like to know. That almost reminds me of like, I don't know if you remember the very end. This is way back in book one. At the end of the journey to Hogwarts chapter where after the first great feast, Harry has like a dream or Uh the the very first Harry dream alert, I believe. Um, And we have like a really cheesy narrator thing that happens where the narrator is like asking like, like the fairy tale narrator type questions of like, and what is this all about? And what is this all about? Uh, I see Melissa grabbed her book one, so hopefully you can find exactly what I'm talking about. Um, shouldn't be very... I, I believe that's the correct spot. Uh, here we go. Let's see if... Um, it's the dream that first night, correct? Mm-hmm. Is that what you're looking up? It says, perhaps Harry had eaten a bit too much because he had a very strange dream. He was wearing Professor Quirrell's turban, which kept talking to him, telling him he must transfer to Slytherin at once because it was his destiny. Harry told the turban he didn't want to be in Slytherin. It got heavier and heavier. He tried to pull it off, but it tightened and painfully and there was Malfoy laughing at him as he struggled with it then Malfoy turned into the hook nose Snape who hook nose teacher Snape whose laugh became high and cold then there was a burst of green light and Harry woke up sweating and shaking that's the dream you were speaking of it is I don't think it's exactly it's not the exact line that I'm that I was hoping for um oh. but there's a point in there's a couple points in book one where the narrator's like and what was Snape up to and like like the narrator asking these questions and like that narrator voice doesn't really like that storybook, like fairy tale story narrator voice doesn't really come back after book one. Um, so I just think it's funny that now it's so 
well developed in the story that we're getting like the same type of like three eat question idea but it's actually coming from the characters and it's all natural and they're i just got a very similar feeling to that if that if you remember that part at all I don't at all, but I will say, I think that goes back to the, um, I don't even know the word I'm looking for is the uh, critique we had of book one compared to book two is that her writing style had matured. And so she was able to fold those exact same kinds of things, but in within the story, as opposed to having to say it separately. Mm-hmm. But yeah, those are absolutely really good questions, kids. <laughs> What was Snape's first year? Slow claps in them. <laughs> well, so I pulled it up on my computer, and because my computer doesn't do the emojis like I did on my phone when I took the notes, it just has little squares. I was like, what did I do there? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm okay. I've got it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about Snape, going along with the Snape theme, right? So Snape believes that Harry is stealing from his private stores, right? That's what we Snape thinks. He thinks that it's Harry who's out and about because in Harry's eyes, it's always Snape's fault. And in Snape's eyes, it's always Harry's fault, even though typically they're both wrong. Um, and so he says, you know, oh, he stole the gillyweed to use in the second task. He stole bloom slang skin. Harry assumes... Now, the gillyweed was obviously stolen by Dobby, but the boom slang skin, Harry just sort of assumes that Snape means from back in year two. And that's what I've always assumed that, oh, okay, when Hermione snuck in and stole it in year two. But, and 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 it was just this time reading through it that I realized this, Snape really means the boom slang skin stolen that night by Barney Crouch Jr. Mm-hmm. Yep. I was slow. Yep. Even that's I didn't awesome. find that revealing. That's a new low for you, Melissa. Oh! <laughs> Like, I was a little disappointed in myself, and I shouldn't have told you, but this is what we do here, right? No. Like, <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. and um, yeah. But I think that's one of the beautiful things about this book. The reveal at the end that Barty Crouch Jr. Oh. was moody is, in my opinion, the best twist in all of the books, which is why I think it is so highly rated when people remember back, like, oh, book four was probably my favorite. Like, a lot of people say that, and I mm-hmm. think a lot of it comes with how well hidden bcj was in the moody character like their motivations align so well for exact different reasons but it's such a a natural like everything quirky and odd that even the things that he says that moody quote unquote moody says it fits right i mean it's like he's never lying he's like just he's just portraying the context so well around being moody that he can still be as honest as possible. I've never hit anything more than a Death Eater that walked free. Yeah, like, yeah, it's perfect. And things like this, until you know, you would never go and look for it. Like, you would never be like, oh, because we have Harry jumping to that conclusion so quickly. It's so neat and tidy. I like it so much. So isn't it interesting, though, like the fact that Barty Jr. and Moody have what seemed to be very parallel character traits, that it's a fine line between falling on the good and the evil. Mm -hmm. But even though they have very similar viewpoints on the world, they're just on such different paths going the same direction. I don't know if it's really going the same direction. They're traveling the same way on different paths. I don't don't, They're just, they just happen to be on exactly the same road. (laughs) Like, because they live in that and they're just going polar sides of it but e- either way it it's hi- highly highly similar and oh. that's why it's so tidy of why it works so well i think i've always questioned why in following books coming going along harry just like automatically like, oh moody's here good oh why? i spent all this time with him like i just know him so yeah. well like like i i've always just questioned that like how is everybody just like super cool with him being around i think even after the reveal hey it's not who you thought it was seeing the real guy the next time i kind of be like eh, um, you're cool bro but we're not friends <laughs> like, <laughs> i don't know I, I will say it's also been one of the tougher things like i still have a difficulty splitting out that this is not moody like i'm like oh yeah he's teaching he's such a great teacher like it just makes sense it, like it also makes you question like why the why is Barty Crouch Jr. such an effective teacher? Like yeah, a lot of it's just like intimidation and that's enrapturing for the students a lot of the time. Like that it's intimidation. Like look at how good he was for Neville. Right. I, yeah, I mean a lot of it's I guess like marionette like trying to like get pieces into place and things like that and Neville becomes one of those pieces with the gillyweed with the book it, he was intended to be at least, but 
I don't know. It, it's like, how is Barty Crouch Jr. this this good? It's almost like Tom Riddle level, like when he was a kid, you know, mm-hmm. like successful type student and translated well into this role. But I don't know. Pretty impressive. I think. I mean, I wonder if some, I mean, there's good genes there because old Barty Crouch was a very powerful and intimidating and like wizard up until sort of his fall from grace, if you will. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's something similar there. Yeah. That we don't see. If you're curious. old man Crouch. I, I, re- I did find the line that I was looking for okay, in book ahead. one. It was actually in chapter eight. I apologize. And I realized why I confused it because it's after the it's the potions master chapter. And I was uh, relating mm-hmm. it with after seeing Snape. So mm-hmm. it's it's the very end of chapter eight in book one. It says, as Harry and Ron walk back to the castle for dinner, their pockets weighed down with the rock cakes they'd been too, ref- too polite to refuse. Harry thought that None of the lessons he'd had so far had given him as much to think about as tea with Hagrid. Had Hagrid collected the package just in time? Where was it now? And and did Hagrid know something about Snape that he didn't want to tell Harry? It's like just one of those like really cheesy storybook things like in Harry's head. Like, but why? Here are the big questions that we have. Like, it's it's very similar to, to those questions that the kids had. I picture Tim Curry reading that (laughs) in the movie Clue. Okay. Like that's, that's how I picture those questions, right? It's him standing in the, in the sort of front hall of the Clue house from the old movie Clue. Why is this? Why is this? I don't know. Let's look in this room. And they all run over to that room to try and figure it out. That's what that reminds me of. Yeah. Yep. So speaking of old Crouch. (laughs) So speaking of old Crouch on page 540 in my book, which I don't have in front of me, the Eagle is coming. The Eagle is coming. Whatever was happening on that page, Harry was seeing an Eagle approach. It was maybe early morning. Morning. There might have been an allery. Was this piece. in the dream? Nope, this is not the dream. This is pre-dream. Because this is the owl coming, the eagle owl coming, Five, if you will. Four. 540. 40. Just kidding. My Kindle doesn't have page numbers, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I thought I was being good. So basically, I think it's an eagle owl coming to inform fake Moody that old Crouch had escaped. So Harry leaned on the windowsill, looking out at the ground at the dark, rustling treetops of the forbidden forest and the rippling sails of the Durmstrang ship. An eagle owl flew through the the coil of smoke rising from Haggard's chimney. It soared towards the castle and around the allery and out of sight. That. I think that is the eagle owl bringing the news of old crouch's escape of the imperious curse and which which chapter was this in 28 28 in the madness of mr crouch so before before that all happens so the only person that we know for sure has an eagle owl are the malfoys we see draco's eagle owl often uh do we know if the malfoy the malfoys don't know anything Mm -hmm. about about Voldemort being back right now. So there's no, no other there than, shouldn't be a connection right now on that. No, other than like we know Karkaroff has been messing with or bothering Snape about the dark mark coming back. So in one would assume what? In class. Yeah, it is. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. Go on. <laughs> no, you're fine. It's that's the truth. I like Lucius might be noticing that. Sure. But I don't think enough to say, hey, let me know where he's hiding and go bring him my owl. Yeah, no, we, we definitely know that that's not true because of what we see huh. when the Death Eaters finally show up in the circle uh, towards the end of this book that Malfoy isn't in the best uh, <laughs> graces with uh, the Dark Lord at the time. Um, but I... I don't know. I've never really thought about that eagle owl. And it, it could very well just be a different eagle owl. Um, but it, I, I like the idea that maybe it was from Wormtail, you know, sending the message to the faithful Death Eater at Hogwarts of like, hey, heads up. Right. That's that's what I always, well, not always, but after the first time reading through, that's what I always assumed that eagle was, was the information coming. But the other thing that we learned whenever... Barty Crouch Jr. is kind of confessing everything, doing his big bad guy monologue uh, towards the end of this. He he kind of tells us that he only knew that he was there because of the Marauder's map. Um, but I think he knew to watch for him. Well, he knew to watch for him because of Chapter 25, where Harry talked about seeing Crouch on the map. That he saw well, himself. he saw himself. Uh, he saw Barty Crouch Jr. Right. on the map. Um, 
know. I think I think he knew to watch for his dad on the map because he got the owl saying, "Hey, he escaped." Okay. That's what I think. Okay. I, I could get behind that. Abby, any thoughts on that? Convinced? Yes. All right. There's there's two people you got now. Awesome. Next up, the whole world. <laughs> All right. Um, also in this chapter, Madness of Mr. Crouch, right? Fake Moody strikes again, right? So let me see if I can figure out where I'm talking about. Um, Harry and Victor see old Crouch. Harry runs off. He comes, he gets interrupted by Snape because Snape is the worst. He gets Dumbledore. They go back to where old Crouch should be and find a knocked out crumb. And lo and behold, here comes Moody miraculously showing up at the right time, right? And he says, oh, Snape said something about Crouch. Mm -hmm. That's his reason, air quotes, for being there. Yeah, that's a fake Moody thing because he was the one who did it. I, I like that he... It must have had the map out then, too, to be able to know that Harry ran into Snape, don't you think? Because how would he know to say that? Because he was the one who did the attacking. I don't really know if that's a question. More of a comment. I kind of wish I had just reread through that portion. I wish I didn't blitz through that portion right before we started this. <laughs> but um, I don't see how else he would know unless he's just using Harry's hatred for Snape or his predisposition to blame Snape and believe he's on the wrong side of things. Either they that, all throw Snape's name in here because... Either that or like Dumbledore, because he's not telling Harry, he's telling Dumbledore. Yeah, it's true. So I don't it, see any other way for it to be possible. Right. Because you know it isn't true. He he wasn't in the castle. It's not like he hmm. that actually happened. He was off burying the transfigured bone of his father's body. He so, did that later. What did he do? He how did he hide him? He transfigured him into a bone after he kills him, but then goes and buries it later. But he had to at least get rid of the bone. Like he was probably off doing something with that in the meanwhile, between attacking Crumb and killing his father. And then by the time, because he could have done that quickly, Harry had to get into the castle, get interrupted by Snape, get Dumbledore, and get back down. That's a considerable amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm trying to quickly look That's through the. Too. It's not like he was even right just there. The confession chapter to see if I can find it real quick where he talks about that scene where Barty Crouch talks about that scene. Junior, Junior, right. Father and I alone in the house. Not quite there. After a while, he began to fight the Imperius curse, just as I had done. There were periods when he knew what was happening. My master decided it was no longer safe for my father to leave the house. He forced him to send letters to the ministry instead. He made him write and say he was ill, but, but Wormtail neglected his duty. He was not watchful enough. My father escaped. My master guessed that he was heading for Hogwarts. My father was going to tell Dumbledore everything to confess. He was going to admit... That he had smuggled me from Azkaban. My master sent me word of my father's escape. He That's told me to stop him at all costs, so I waited and watched. I used the map I had taken from Harry Potter. The map had almost ruined everything. Potter's map of Hogwarts. Potter saw me on it. Potter saw me stealing ingredients for, pol for the Polyjuice Potion from Snape's office one night. He thought, I was my father. We have the same first name. I took the map from Potter that night. I told him my father hated Dark Wizards. Potter's Potter believed my father was after Snape. Okay, and here this this whole thing is like exactly what we're <laughs> uh -huh. for a week. I waited for my father to arrive at Hogwarts. At last, one evening, the map showed my father entering the grounds. So he's just watching the map consistently. I don't think the eagle out uh, it was necessarily sending message that day. Maybe beforehand. Um, I pulled on my invisibility cloak and went down to meet him. He was walking around the edge of the forest. Then Potter came and Crumb, and I waited. I could not hurt Potter. My master needed him. Potter ran to get Dumbledore. I stunned Crumb, killed my father, um, and then carried carried the body into the forest. And then he went back and transfigured it into a bone and buried it. So he saw him on the map that just that day because he had been constantly vigilant in his watching of the map but he said his master sent word but it sounded like that was over a week beforehand well yeah but i mean he had been constantly vigilant because his master sent word yes my yeah, only point is that eagle owl that came that day. same morning i thought mm -mm. it was just the beginning of that chapter okay. didn't have that day. either way yes most of that is is just how you were saying at least maybe all of it it is it is it's all of it it's fine i just like how hidden it is in there mm-hmm until you know it, there's no way you would know that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's good stuff. 
I like these chapters. This is like part of the exciting parts of these books. <laughs> we're, okay. we're in the thick of it. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about Snape because you hate that guy. Talk about the baby. No, it doesn't work. Nope. I'm really sorry. Nope. <laughs> nope. Okay. So this, this always happens like at the start of the next chapter, pretty much. I, I'm assuming because again, no book in front of me and these notes are old, but they were discussing, they, Harry, Ron, Hermione, were discussing if Snape was the one who made Crouch disappear. They always really do jump to blaming Snape, don't they? Like it is, Snape is always an option on the table. First of all, that's my first thought. Yes, we agree. Yeah. Yeah. Is Snape a reasonable option on the table every single time? No. Every single time. Yes. <laughs> Narrow-minded. I don't like it. Who, me? Her mind should be smarter than that. Oh, the kids. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, no, she shuts it down 95% of the time. I Every know. time she shuts it down. Yeah, because it's usually Ron. Like, let's be honest. And it's he's usually pretty close to being right, because guess what? Snape is awful. But he's not awful in the way Ron always assumes no, he's, he's awful. he's worse. <laughs> Okay, so it might be unreasonable for the things they're accusing Snape of doing, but he's still a terrible human being. Fair? From their perspective, it is not unreasonable for them to think it's him again. He's never actually done any of the super terrible things. They haven't but... confirmed that he was, in fact, a Death Eater. It's not no. only either way. It's consistently, over and over, more and more and more proof that he's not necessarily the best guy. And they get consistently more and more proof that, yeah... Guess what? Dumbledore is literally the only person, the only person that trusts him. The other teachers don't even trust him. Like, it just keeps piling on. So I, I think it's completely reasonable every time they bring it up that they have no reason to believe him. Okay. Anyway, my real point, I'm moving on. So Ron asks if Snape could have beaten Harry back to the forest, right? In the whole Snape trying to prevent Harry from getting down there thing. Mm-hmm. Harry replies, not unless he can turn himself into a bat or something. I love that line. Which is really funny. But then we discover in book seven that Snape can, in fact, fly unaided. Mm -hmm. That happens um, at the Hogwarts scene in the Great Hall. So, and while he didn't, he, Snape, did not have anything to do with Crouch. He did not. Could he have had this ability to fly unaided at this time and used it for other things? Or is it something that he specifically learned once Voldemort came back to power? Abby, what do you think? I would assume that he's had this ability for a while. That would just be my assumption. No facts. I've, I've always thought it was something that he picked up after being back with Voldemort because it was such a big deal when Voldemort showed that he could fly unaided. Um, so I've always thought it was just something that he passed along to Snape at that point. Um, one follow-up to that, when we learn that Snape can also fly, this is this is exactly what it reads. Book 7, chapter number 30, The Sacking of Severus Snape. With a tinge of horror, Harry saw in the distance a huge bat-like shape flying through the darkness toward the perimeter wall. I will say, like, when I was younger and I read that, I always read that as Snape turned into a bat, like, was actually an animagus, um, which we kind of learned is not the case, but... That's how I always took it, and that's why this line here in book four also tickles me so much, because he is, he is a bat. Sometimes it takes people years to turn into bats. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. I was thinking of certain vampires, but it's fine. Okay, I was going with the Bruce Wayne. I was just going with the most recent casting of Batman. Oh, that's right. Gotcha. It fits. Okay. Um to think if i have anything that like if your guys' stuff fits with any of this or if i should just keep going i have three more notes if you want me to keep going with all of my yeah, crazy yeah yeah go for it okay so there's just a little bit of foreshadowing um george predicted that ron would become a prefect you keep it this up you're gonna turn into a prefect exactly and i believe isn't that in your fun owlery scene yes where they're talking over each other and it's like the best comedy of errors ever. you don't ask us what we're doing and we won't ask you what we're doing what you're doing <laughs> Oh, so I, I thought that was funny that George called him out on it. Mm -hmm. and he was, I like George being right. Um, I want to apologize to all of our listeners because I almost screwed up chapter 29. I remember that. <laughs> I had a chuckle to myself <laughs> about that. Edited it out and it didn't happen. And I was like, I've made it almost four whole books without spoiling a damn thing. And here I go. And I did it almost. It was subtle. <sighs> it was in the location introductions of that chapter. And because we have Harry's dream in the chapter uh, called The Dream, where 
we I've always assumed they, that it was at the Riddle House. Um, and I think that's kind of what you're supposed to take from it until you realize, yeah, this is probably at Crouch's house where they've been keeping him imprisoned. And yeah. Melissa was like, no, this is probably Crouch's house. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> might, might be. Who knows? No evidence of that whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I was like... Okay. And that, like, I eventually stopped talking. It was bad. It was, oh. I think I just left it with, hey, let's go with Riddle House. It could be somewhere else, too. Yeah, it was like, oh, just <laughs> let's not be in the episode. And he did it there. So that's, oh, well. that, that's my one. We Half do not edit. Three, I get, I know. <laughs> Abby knows. I know. <laughs> Edit. So that that was my my one, and I was not so happy. Well, uh, that's okay. I I get I can mess up once. That that was my big one. That I was it. Myself. One more okay. time, and yeah. Okay, so my last kind of thought for spoilery stuff. So Barty Jr. in the Pensieve chapter is pleading for his innocence, right? Please, mm -hmm. Dad, you know it wasn't me. It wasn't me. This does not mesh at all with what he says under Veritas Serum about being loyal to Voldemort all this time. You know, oh, I'm the most faithful servant. Oh, he will reward me, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if I buy that these two actions and these two like reactions out in public belong to the same character mm -hmm. particularly that the um holier than thou voldemort supporter came after an imprisonment and having to live with dementors and almost dying from that and then being under his father's control like it just feels very untrue at least the the whining and complaining and and crying baby version feels so foreign to this barty crouch character that's been building mm -hmm. I don't know. Thoughts? I really dislike the baby one. Yeah, me too. Like, I really dislike him. I didn't used to. I didn't, like, part of me when I was younger reading this, I felt bad for him. I'm like, well, you know, and may like, maybe he's this, and oh, those parents. And now it's like, no way, boy. That's your own fault, right? It almost has, no like, when innocent. you're reading reading that portion of the chapter, it has a very Stan Shunpike feel to it, where he gets brought up on charges, and it seems like he's just lumped in with a bunch of people. And not yeah. necessarily like actually kind of like wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. But the the one interaction I would love to have had that will just never happen would have been after everyone after basically after this book, Death Eaters, you know, all start coming back. Book five, when there's the big mass breakout of Azkaban and Bellatrix Lestrange is back with Voldemort. If Marty Crouch Jr. was still around and not soul sucked. Um, and seeing the interaction of Barty Crouch Jr. pulling the most loyal supporter and having her come in knowing how yeah. he was during that trial, like that would have been a really, really interesting scene um, to, to play out. Well, even like Barty as Moody, the thing I hate more than anything is a Death Eater who walked free, and yet that's what he was trying to do. That's what he did do. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, in the trial, he was trying to yeah. get out of it. So yeah. he was doing the exact thing that he later claims he hates the most. Is it because, like, does he hate it the most? Not because he was more um, faithful and they weren't? Or is it that he got caught and couldn't get out of it and they either didn't get caught or they got caught and talked their way out of it? Or able to get out of it. Off. Hmm. That's a really good point. Very good point. I don't know. Like, it definitely makes me question his most, most faithful servant thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe that's new. Maybe that's, maybe he didn't always feel that way. But maybe now it's like, okay, now I can finally do something. Right. I deem myself for being, okay, maybe I'm talking myself into it making a little more sense. But I'm really <laughs> whiny. It, it does feel a little bit out of character for how we know him and how his character is portrayed. I completely agree with that. I will say, just real quick, I almost think there are times where Barty Crouch Jr.'s character, if he would have continued on would have been a much more compelling villain to have a, a secondary villain than Bellatrix Lestrange. Um, I, we'll, we'll get into that later, but I, I think the background knowledge that he personally has with Harry could have made that a lot more uh, interesting for certain things. It's useful to Voldemort because like for the rest of the series, nobody has as much knowledge of Harry. Oh, yeah. That's close to Voldemort until Snape goes back at the end of book six. But even Snape's view of Harry is so skewed mm -hmm. because he both hates him and right. spends his protecting him. And it's just wonky. Where like, Crouch just has a truly analytical, well-versed view of what yeah. Harry actually is. 
and what he's capable of, mm-hmm. right? Not overestimating or underestimating so, your opponent. I just feel like he'd have been a more dangerous ally for uh, okay. Voldemort to have. Okay, and I'm done. It can be your guys' turn now. Abby, take it yeah. away. So I only have a few notes. I did think it's funny when Hermione and Harry and Ron are speaking about um, the article that has come out that Rita has written about Hermione, which is awful, by the way. Like, yeah. Who writes that about a kid, a teenager? Like, that's terrible gossip column. Um, but she's asking, like, how, do, how does she know these things? How could she have heard this? And she uh, has a bowl of beetles that she's about to uh, chop up. <laughs> So I'm like, man, Rita, are you getting all this? Like, are you that uh, into your job? You're so dedicated that you'll throw yourself into this bowl of beetles? <laughs> I don't know. Funny. This could have been the day that did in Rita Skeeter. Skeeto. <laughs> Rita Skeeter. It would have been a funny mosquito. Like that would have been, that'd have been a funny uh, name play right there. That would have been better. Um, I also, so like Sirius mentions like he knows Barty Crouch Sr. because he never, he was thrown into Azkaban with no trial. Right. How does that happen? Martial law. I mean, that, that's kind of what it seems like it turns into is. Uh, is what it seemed like. <coughs> Sorry, my book just fell. Um, <laughs> Sirius is describing is martial law. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we have Dumbledore, who is like all knowing, it seems like at times, right? Like he doesn't question at all that oh, these people were thrown into prison. I would say Dumbledore was probably com- trying his best to combat that. But we also know that Dumbledore himself is afraid of himself being in power. So if he starts stepping in too much, mm-hmm. then he's going to be thrust into that. Right. And he doesn't trust himself with it. That's how, that's how I, I... He always very much works through other people but it's not necessarily looking like him that's why he looks like such a puppet master is because he tries to create separation between true power and himself because he's terrified of it it's why he sent newt's commander to get uh grindelwald and mm-hmm. didn't well it's part of the reason why right he's that newt's commander and i think I, i'm putting a lot of blame right there just on Dumbledore. but there's not another person in the wizarding world that thinks like hey maybe we should talk to this guy right. not a single one like i just feel like uh i don't know what 13 years down the road maybe we it wouldn't have taken that long to figure out old homeboy is alive and well like even if it's some um, a conspiracy theory, there would have been some type of knowledge somewhere. I just think it's a huge oversight on their part. But so right pandemonium a- scared. Right, right along with that terrible. is like living in this horror stricken right. society. Like that that's kind of a natural thing that happens of guess what? We can't do anything about this. This is one of like the final draws that we can make, and it may seem drastic, but at least someone's doing something. At least we're trying to make headway. All of these things that we're seeing, the Sirius's lack of trial and all of the trials we saw, all happened after Voldemort fell. So, and I can't think of a good real world parallel that isn't going to seem judgmental on my part. So I'm not going to draw one. But it's that idea of after something super scary and bad has ended, then comes this period of big righteousness, right? The like blame. not not so much the blame, but like like after World War II, you had the baby boom where everybody like like the domestic life and everybody is happy and everything on TV is happy because like now we have our power back and we have the control back. And after 9-11, right, the whole country came together because oh, we're going to be so American now because we're all going to band together. And none of those things are bad. I'm not trying to put any kind of negative connotation on those because that's important. It's a way to heal and move forward. But I think this is a similar scenario in that this is a a country, if you will, like a a secret society country, but a country that is trying to heal after a major terrorist attack, really like a terrorist invasion of 11 years. And so a way to take that power back is to sort of lash out irrationally at whatever piece of that they can get. And since they could never get Voldemort because he was dead, then all of the followers that they can get their hands on, they probably are too harsh. There probably isn't a sense of um, leniency or yeah, like, like the sense of innocent till proven guilty. It's probably you're this and, and we're going to make an example of you and we're going to make an example of all of you and just almost like a mob mentality. Right. It's it's, it's definitely not very uh, 
<laughs> objective or it is very objective it's not subjective other way around yeah it's i was not, gonna say i had it right the first time <laughs> yeah sorry it is very subjective and very for the look of things and for and it's very much about how does this alleviate the feelings of the people who have been victimized for so long as opposed to the rights of the person being accused and just because they're accused does not automatically make them guilty, but they're being treated that way because it's not about them. It's about, and not even the victims like the dead, just like the people in the room who had been scared. I've, I don't know how to explain that better. I've always just equated it to like the thought of like, this was like the Nuremberg trials. Right. That's after. what I was thinking of as well. But there wasn't a trial like that. Did, but I get what you're saying. Like they are over overzealous on making sure that people pay their and rightfully so. They've just lived through a horrible conflict, loss of life and terror. So they what I was saying, like with the blade, they want whoever is responsible. They want to make sure that, yes, an example is made of them and we get these people off the street so that we can live unscared. But I just think like, man, if somebody had just talked to him, it's one person, it, it's a lot of power to put on one person to have ultimate. Hey, I found you. Now you're going into uh, Azkaban. So one last kind of thought I have on on that exact idea is you know as this what 11 12 years that voldemort was gaining power and creating this society of terror right you know however long that was going on these i'm sure these were changes that progressively happened it wasn't just like oh now we're just gonna start taking away trials like no it's something that escalated and escalated and they had to do something so they start stripping down some freedoms which happens that happens and mm -hmm. so as that goes on and on and on more and more of these freedoms of these individuals get taken away before it's even possible to have that so i i'm sure like at the time you know society condones it because it's productive and it seems like it's doing the right thing but then you look back on it when you have those back and things are calmed down and you're like wow okay that was maybe extreme but like in the time probably the Pretty close to a majority of people were like, well, yeah, this is what we needed to do. And guess what? It worked. It worked a high percent of the time, maybe not perfect, but it still worked well enough that we were OK with it. And we signed off on this along the way. So it's not like just Crouch should be blamed for this. It's a it's no. an institutional thing that developed is how I look at it, I guess. What is it like the approval percentage on this mm -hmm. for the people at the time was probably pretty high. It, like, at least 51 percent is where I'm at. Like <laughs> Definitely. Just, you know, I went with. I, I went a very different way on my connection to your thought. Um, in Fight Club, how the the Edward Norton's character's mm -hmm. job is to work for the insurance companies to go look and see what happens in car wrecks to see if it's worth their money to do recalls or if like the fact that these things are happening to cars are like worth the cost to just not recall it. Mm -hmm. Like the collateral damage. Yeah, we're okay with like, we're going to have a few missteps. A few are going to break. It's fine. Yeah, you cut your losses and guess what? It's right. it's still working overall. So, yeah. which is dangerous, but it happens. Like it just does. Fight Club is dangerous too, but yes. sorry. I think that might be the randomest connection I've had on a Harry Potter podcast. Potentially. <laughs> okay. Um, Abby, do you have any other notes? I have one more. Um, in the Pensieve chapter, Dumbledore expresses concern about three people, but the one I want to talk about is uh, Frank Bryce. Yeah. Like, first of all, Dumbledore is awesome. Truth. He's so cool. Like, he's so cool. He's just so cool. <laughs> How does he know? Like, I just, he's so connected and he's so tuned in personally, like, of looking for like certain things or certain shifts to change and notice these tiny elements and him picking up on Frank Bryce to me just is super surprising. Yes. Because uh, that's not his job. Like it's not. Well, it kind of is. Because he's like, already on his Horcrux hunt at this point, right? He's already got the inkling yeah. that the Horcrux thing, he doesn't know for sure. Like he, we know it, it's not until Harry gets the final memory from Slughorn that yes, absolutely, I'm trying to find seven Horcruxes. But I think he already has a pretty good idea that there are multiple of them. And so he's already in his young Tom Riddle history right. research mode. So I think it is his job to know who the guard, like basically he, he wouldn't, he would know about Voldemort's parents and he knows that Frank Bryce was the one blamed for it. Like that, that's kind of, 
probably not too difficult to pick up just by reading newspapers of when that happened. Right. And then when he finds out, oh, and now Frank Bryce is dead, mysteriously, looks pretty similar to, you know, uh, magical means. Like, I'm all with you. Like, I love that he picks this up, but he kind of specifically would be looking for stuff like that, right? I, but all he says is, like, I, unlike my other counterparts or whatever, think that muggle news is important. So, like, I agree that, yes, it seems very Dumbledore-y to know this, but here we go. Here's my next really random reference. <laughs> in Men in Black, oh my gosh. I told you, it, it's the day. In Men in Black, like, when they're trading the the new guy, when Will Smith is new, and, and Tommy Lee Jones is trading, he's like, oh, we gotta go check the hot sheet and it's all the research and he pulls out like he goes to the new scene and buys Tabloids. all the national fires, yeah right like this is the hot sheets yep best investigated for reporting on the planet i think that's kind of what dumbledore is doing right like i'm just gonna scan all the news for like the crazy stuff right the stuff that muggles are might be writing off but really isn't the outlier stories yes yeah Yet, like, shouldn't that be a job in the ministry? This is where I'm going with this. Like, why is it just Dumbledore? Yes. Like, we have a whole ministry of magic. We have auras, 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 auras. We have auras. And, um, like, just these departments. And it just seems like, to me, the idea of magic, like, they have all this, like, college, college, knowledge and ability at their fingertips why is there just one man who's like kind of on this kooky outer box way of thinking or not really thinking of knowing of research it just so boggles my mind where's the fbi where's the profilers i need to know the mi6 of (laughs) yes the ministry i mean seriously you should be monitoring muggle news for unusual activity That, that should just be like a somebody's job all the time wouldn't it be uh mr weasley's no that's no, more that's the misuse of muggle artifacts yeah i know so. but i feel like it has to be an office attached something well, we know them. how overworked they probably are since last year everyone at the ministry was responsible for catching serious black literally no matter yeah. who you were you were working extra overtime trying to find serious black that was so they're still, you know, a year behind in policy and work and stuff. So like they're they're overworked as as it is. Okay, I don't even want to get started on how wrong it is that they're pulling people off of normal political <laughs> government jobs, <laughs> job of like the trash guy. <laughs> yeah. Right, the janitor. You're telling me the janitor has to stop doing his job. Uh, okay. I I like to imagine that somebody at the ministry is overseeing reviewing Muggle news. Dumbledore is just the only person that would realize Frank Bryce's name as something specific. And that that's how I feel about it, I guess, because he would have that connection baked Unless into his brain. The report was a lot like the report from when Frank Bryce found the riddles at the beginning that abs- that the coroner said in, in shock as though they had to find something wrong with them, that they were perfectly healthy other than the fact they were dead. And they were, all had a looks of like fear and shock. Who would ever heard of three healthy adults being scared to death? Right. Like my guess is something like that was in some sort of report mm-hmm. that had been caught by somebody like, right. oh, nothing's wrong with you and you're dead. Sounds like a magical murder to me. Right. In which case, you send out a squad of people. Come on. And maybe that they did. I don't know. Maybe they did. Yeah. Okay. One one final note that, well, I guess I got two quick things. Uh, we have the introduction to Veritaserum here, which is uh, becomes a more useful thing later on. Probably not as uh, used as it could have been. That's one of those, like, that, that, that's one of those, like, really powerful things that, like, gets regulated so that they can't use it in the story very much. Uh, but... If you have once you have it there, not using it doesn't make sense. Right, right. And I, I know there's a lot of information outside of the stories of I think it's mostly on Pottermore that like, yeah, even it's like the question of, well, if you're imperious to say something and you still get Veritas here, I'm like, well, it break the imperious curse. Like, will you be able to not lie even though you're be like it's like one of those combative type things. Um Rock, paper, scissors. Right, basically. And it there's a lot of stuff out there so it's interesting that like it's not infallible it's just the most it's just the strongest Mm -hmm. truth serum it's not infallible is is what it 
because they even don't rely on it in trials uh, for for certain reasons too. Like if you have a certain will and uh, constitution, you can kind of thwart it, just like a regular lie detector test if you can control yourself well enough. That, that stuff's out there. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up, that it's interesting that Snape threatens a 14-year-old with this. Uh, come on, man. Anyway. Yeah, he was really bad in these chapters. Yeah, he is, just in general. Um, but one last line that I want to reference is a line from Sirius when they're in the cave, and it says, She's got the measure, measure of Crouch better than you do. Ron, uh, if you want to know what a band's like, take a good look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those really strong lines. People remember it. It's sage advice, right? Um, but then at the same time, and I don't want to dwell too much into this now because we'll have plenty of time in book five and six to talk about it. The way Sirius treats Creature doesn't seem to jive well with this um at least it, it seems to go against his own advice or maybe he doesn't think very much of himself kind of thing so it's just interesting that Sirius is the one that makes this pretty responsible line and then kind of do as i say not as i do almost feeling uh, later on which make a lot of people really don't not like uh Sirius much uh, and overall, I, I like Sirius, but I can kind of see where this is a pretty big linchpin on why why he might not be the best guy ever. <laughs> so right. just thought it was worth pointing out since that line happens here. Well, that pretty much wraps us up for our unrestricted section on chapters 26 through 30. Abby, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. What exciting things do you have coming up? You have so many exciting things. Um, well, the most exciting thing I have is the podcast that fights in F-words. It's an Outlander podcast where we take a journey through all things Outlander. Um, finishing up season one here next few weeks. On to season two. Um, that's it. You can find us at um, thepodcastthat.com or wherever you're... Is it aggregated the word I want? Yeah. Podcatchers. Pod anywhere Something. you get podcasts aggregated. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, there you go. Those words that Luke uses that I just love. Podcatcher and aggregated. <laughs> check out a podcast that fights and F words. Definitely check out that show where you hear, you could hear Abby doing her best Luke impressions uh, while she hosts. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Cracks me up. Um, you can find out more from us here at must not be named at not named podcast on Twitter and Instagram, where we post pictures and stuff. Uh, send us an email to notnamedpodcast at gmail.com. Check out this show and all of the shows at thepodcast.com. While you're there, go to the support us page and go on the Audible affiliate link. You can still go on there and get a free 30-day trial and a free book on us just for signing up. And they give us a nice little kickback and you can get yourself a book. There's a lot of them. They're really good. I'm going through a book right now called Battle Mage. It's worth checking out by Peter Flannery. So that's my recommendation. You can listen to this show and all of our shows free on Radio Public. So download their iOS or Android app. It's free, easy to use, and helps listeners like you find and support shows like ours when you listen to our show on Radio Public's app. Everyone benefits. And we will see you next week when we go through chapter number 31. The third tack. Stay imaginary. Thanks.